on Saturday, September 29th, two fathers from New York were killed at a military checkpoint in some far-off place called Wardak Province in Afghanistan. Sergeant First Class Daniel Metcalf of Liverpool, New York, became number 2,000 in this war's casualty list of the military. He was 29 years old and leaves behind a wife and three young children. His oldest is six. The other father is a man who worked as a civilian contractor with NATO, a former sergeant with the New York City Police Department and member of the city's elite emergency services unit who was working thousands of miles away from home and his two teenage children, a man who could fix anything and someone who could get you out of anything. Kevin O'Rourke is someone I knew. I only have a snapshot of him from the two years I spent in the 23rd Precinct for a book project. While he introduced me to his wife, Stacy, I didn't see him at home on Long Island or witness the bonds with his family and friends or as a brother in the military and the police department. In my line of work, I am merely an observer, and I rode with cops on patrol to document the day-to-day -day life of the precinct from sunup to sundown that represented them during this fixed point in time. As a recorder of people in both words and photographs, some people stick with you and they and their words and faces come back to you in an instant. They help shape and define you, sometimes with a jolt, sometimes subtly, and other times it's a slow cooking process. Kevin stuck with me. I saw a piece of him and that was at work as a sergeant on patrol in East Harlem. He pulled up in the afternoons in an old car, often with a cigar in hand and a bag of tools. He came to work in the NYPD just as his father did, and his squad of cops on the 4-12 to 12 shift liked and respected him. There was something sturdy and rooted about Kevin, a sense of confidence that he could handle anything and that everything would turn out all right. Cops can be as finicky as cats, and they don't always like or respect their supervisors, no matter how well they've scored on civil service exams or how much experience they have. Sergeants and other supervisors operated on the basis of their personalities, predispositions, strengths and fears, ethics, training, and orders. Some were leaders, wanted to be in charge, others were in charge, some wanted to be buddies, others couldn't care less. Kevin cared. And because he felt that all of us were his responsibility and treated his squad with respect, they knew that when he showed up at a scene, it wasn't to berate or bully them or to find something wrong. He was not afraid to make a decision, and the cops knew that when he showed up, he would be level-headed and pragmatic. Everyone mattered. His driver was the oldest serving police officer in the precinct, a man who carried a history of the NYPD within him, and they bonded well. Walter McKenney, who knew the streets inside and out, always drove Kevin. Often, the men talked more than the women. This wasn't the case here, though. Kevin spoke of his father, Stacy, who worked with the housing police downtown, their home in Long Island, setting up some contraption to brew beer, and I remember he told me what about one of his first jobs, working with Estee Lauder, the cosmetics company, in the warehouse and always having free samples on hand for his girlfriends. And sometimes there were the silences that bond men together. We joke that in our old age, all of us, whether we liked each other or not, would all wind up in the same nursing home together. I wish I could remember more of the conversations, had spent more time with him, had taken more photographs, had stayed in touch. I rode less with Kevin because sergeants are typically not as active as the cops who answer jobs on the radio. They often show up later at the scene or are inside handling paperwork, something he never liked, I recall. He hated sitting in traffic as I did because it means you could be doing something else. I can see his police car pulling up slowly to the patrol car I rode in, facing us in the street. How you doing, Sarge? The cop driving would call out, passing their memo books through the car window. He signed the books and asked how everything was and asked how we were doing. 
getting some good stuff, he would call out to me, everything okay? And then he would drive off with a little wave, turning the corner and then out of sight. Kevin taught me tactics and reminded me not to stand in front of apartment doors when cops knocked on them. Someone with a gun could shoot through it and that jumping out of the patrol car first was perhaps not a good idea. It was a habit based on curiosity and, well, I tried. Kevin also suggested writing the address of where we were in the event I had to grab a police radio in an emergency. Most of the time I scribbled the address in my notebook and thankfully there was never an emergency. Once Kevin standing behind the desk, behind the complaint window in the command and I were in conversation, the days of time passing have dulled the memory of words. Might have been about writing. He gave me the first compliment I received from anyone in the 23rd precinct. Cops don't often compliment each other, let alone a stranger that not everyone wanted documenting their work. I don't remember the context, but have never forgotten the words. You can tell by your eyes how intelligent you are. Knowing me, I probably made a flip comment, but it made me respect him even more. Two other cops said that if I were a cop, they would partner with me. I'm sure others couldn't wait for me to leave, but his compliment is the one I carry with me. Kevin would have made a great commanding officer, but he hated correcting paperwork, wasn't interested in taking any more civil service exams, and at heart was an emergency services guy who liked to fix things. The more challenging, the better. He looked at me in desperation one day after reviewing paperwork. Can't you teach these guys how to write, he asked impatiently. I think his time at the 23rd Precinct was really a stopover before he returned to emergency services, which he eventually did, teaching scuba diving. And here is an excerpt from the book. Just across from the desk, Sergeant Kevin O'Rourke handles roll call, reminding the ranks of veterans and rookies about how to fill out arrest and stop and frisk reports, complaining of incomplete information, poor grammar, and spelling on previous submissions. Called 61's arrest reports detail the names and address of criminals and victims and outline time, place, and occurrence. There has to be a story. Put it in chronological order. Fill the story out. Actions of victim? Fill that out, he instructs, sounding impatient. What were they doing? Standing on the street corner? Mark that down. Let's make the 61's more complete. Maybe I can offer you a little help. Stop us. Let us see the 61s. If you get hit with an object, that's an assault too. Everyone has a vest? His squad taps their chest in affirmation. Anything on this 4 to 12 watch would be his responsibility. He mentions cops committing suicide. In case you haven't heard, and if you want to talk about anything, that shit stays with me. You have someone to talk to. With his dark Irish looks and thick brush of a mustache, Sergeant O'Rourke looks as if he stepped out of Teddy Roosevelt's days as police commissioner a century earlier. A former cop in the emergency services unit before he was promoted, O'Rourke is accustomed to dealing with far more serious crises like suicidal jumpers, people trapped in cars and apartments, and building collapses. It's like a juggling act, O'Rourke says of his new role. You have to deal with every cop as an individual. Some think that they're in high school or on some sort of sightseeing trip. I've had people say that if it weren't for the money, they wouldn't be here. And there are police families. You do what your father did. O'Rourke became a cop, like his father, a retired detective. I've always loved this job, he says enthusiastically. When Dad joined in 1964, it was still a romantic job. The kids in the neighborhood in Queens knew that your father's a cop. It was almost like a status symbol. When he completes roll call and his squad lines up for radios and car keys, a sad-eyed pooch observes the scene from the back of the room, astray from the streets. An officer grabs a can of apple from the kitchen and feeds it to the dog on a paper plate. Well, that's one redeeming quality that you have, someone quips wryly. You like animals. Walter McKenney, a cop for over 20 years, stands behind the desk. He used to be Sergeant O'Rourke's designated driver. He's had 2,000 years on the job, says a patrolman, pointing to McKenney's white hair. O'Rourke and his squad gather outside in the parking lot, passing the incoming day tour. A few exchange high fives as they prepare 
for their evening's work. I remember riding with him, sharing the back seat with his large tool bag when a call came over the radio for a man stuck in an elevator in one of the neighborhood housing projects. Central, I'll take that, he spoke into the police radio. Kevin, Walter, and I trudged up I don't know how many flights of stairs. You okay back there? Kevin called back. Not sure yet, I responded, winded and perspiring. I'll let you know when I get there. He leaned into the door of the stuck elevator. How's everyone doing, he called into the crack of the door. We'll get you out in no time. He opened his bag of tools and made a few adjustments. And just as he pressed one of the tools into the elevator, I had the great sense to take a photograph. The camera flash went off in a blinding light. Kevin jumped back and looked, well, shocked. I thought I had been electrocuted, he said, laughing. I remember Walter's deep chuckle. Well, if this had been the case, you wouldn't be here. <laughs>